Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back once again to the Music and Ministry Podcast. I am your host, Stephen Reed. So glad that you joined us because today we have a very special opportunity to share with you an interview that we did with Jonathan and Melissa Helser, who are a part of the Bethel Music Collective, and they also run a school out in North Carolina and do some other things. For sure, you have know some of their work because they wrote No Longer Slaves. They also wrote Raise a Hallelujah, two songs that have been very popular over the last little bit, and they have such a distinctive sound and voice. So glad that they were able to get on the phone and chat with us about the new album that's coming out for Bethel, well, it's out by now, and their contribution to those songs. So they had a lot to offer, a lot to talk about. So let's get into that conversation, and I know that you are going to have a great time with Jonathan and Melissa Helser. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for joining us, and then I want to talk to you about the brand new album that just came out today, which is the Bethel Collective album called Revivals in the Air. And so I wanted to talk to you about that because, you know, I think a lot of people have some misunderstanding about what these albums are because it, it really is a collective album from all the various artists uh, that are connected with Bethel Church. And you guys are out in North Carolina. We've got Brandon Lake is over there at Seacoast. We've got Corey Ashbury. He's up in Kalamazoo. Dante, he's in Atlanta. Uh, kind of talk to us about the vision, maybe the heart behind what these albums are, and maybe how you guys stay connected as um, worship leaders to a church that is thousands of miles away at times. Yeah, well, we've been a part of Bethel Music since 2014, and that came from a friendship with Brian and Jen in the house, probably over like from 2012, 2013, over the few years. It's kind of fun because I think we were the first artist that were brought onto the label, though it feels more like being a part of a, a big extended family more than a label in a lot of ways. Yeah, for sure. Um, but we were the first kind of outside worship leaders brought in that weren't actually living in Redding, California. Wow. Um, so, uh, and then now, like you said, all those, the guys, all the guys you just mentioned, they're all not in Redding as well. Um, so I think we were kind of the, their guinea pigs to see if this would work. <laughs> so they must have been impressed because they've definitely reached out. Yeah. And I think, you know, they've just spent Bethel as a church is a multi-generational. Um, Brian, uh, his dad is the pastor. And then Brian's granddad was the, one of the worship leaders and the pastors of the church. It's a multi-generational movement. Um, and so... I think I think when we first came on, we're like, is this going to work? We're in North Carolina. They're in California. Um, but because such our our DNA and our core values were so similar, it really has been really seamless in a lot of ways. And they've been able to service like a music label would service. But then at the same time, there's been this deep family kingdom connection that's made it re work really, really well. Yeah, I think most people are really surprised to find out that you are separated because it seems so connected and your hearts are so connected. How are you guys doing that? Is there relationship? I mean, obviously there's touring and things like that, but how are you staying connected? Yeah, we go out at least a couple times a year. Right now we're a little more limited as the rest of the world is on travel. Uh, but we're out three, probably two to three times a year. And, um, and then there's just been organic relationships that have been sustained through it, co-writing, you know, all, all, just the friendship has really has been the centerpiece of it. And I think, too, me and Jonathan really love relationship. And so I think we've just set our hearts from from the time we joined them that we were going to give ourselves to building deeper relationships with Brian and Jen and, and just the different worship leaders and the house. So. We definitely, I would say, even outside of going there, have very intentionally said, like, we don't want to just be connected. We actually want to do, like, real relationship. And it's been a huge blessing to our hearts. That's awesome. To just have those kind of deep relationships with people that, you know, want to change the world. So Yeah, and have a similar heart for yeah. ministry. Well, it definitely is reflected in the album. And so I was curious, you know, knowing that everybody's separated and and yet there's such a theme to the album, how are those songs selected? Are you guys writing? Are you just kind of submitting songs? Yeah, 
Well, I think one of the things about this album that's super special is probably a year before we even started fully diving into writing the songs, as a church, they asked the Lord what the focus for the next album was. And the original title of the album was God of Revival, which is became one of Brian's songs. But from Bill, who's like the captain of the ship in a lot of ways, um, and really pioneering and steering us into this beautiful movement that's happening in Reading, he, he spoke to us and said, I want you guys to really start asking the Lord for the songs that the church, what they need to be singing five years from now. Just don't think about maybe next week, but what five years, 10 years from now, like uh -huh. what is the, what is the Lord saying? And so I think for all of us songwriters, it really put us in this place of like getting on our face before the Lord, asking him, what is, what is revival look like? What is awakening reformation? Uh, what does this look like? And so there was this common like, place of we were all seeking the Lord around this theme of revival. And then I love it because Brandon's in Charleston, uh, Corey's up north. Like you're saying, we're on the East Coast and they're over there. But it really was this corporate seeking of what revival is. Well, and Bill Johnson has the ability to just blow your mind with one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> wow. Five years from now. That's an amazing place to write from. Mm -hmm. um, so. Melissa, you sing one of, well, basically the title track, which revivals in the air. And I uh, was listening to it and, uh, you know, I think people are really going to enjoy the upbeatness and the, the fun of the song. It's kind of got like an Irish jig sound to it. For it sure, for sure. Just sounded really fun to write. And when you guys were recording it, obviously just that transfers through. Talk to us about how that song came and why you went that, that route with it. And um, It's actually a really special song to me. I, I actually took the year off last year because of um, the chronic illness that I have. And so I was actually pretty pulled, withdrawn from, I didn't tour, I didn't go out to Reading. Um, and I actually wasn't writing much at all um, because I was just resting. And in the fall, um, my, uh, I came to a bit of a crisis moment with one of my family members. And we had just started really, really intentionally praying for breakthrough in his life. And it was it was pretty deep. Um, and we had probably been praying really intentionally for a couple months. And I was sitting in my living room one night. Again, I, I hadn't really been writing a lot of songs. I didn't go into like, how can I write a joyful, upbeat song about revival? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I was just sitting in my living room and I was actually playing my ukulele. Um, which it is a ukulele on the song. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, I write a lot on a ukulele because it's it's easier for me to play with my arthritis. And so I was sitting in my living room playing my, my uke and just praying um, for my brother. And I ha my phone buzzed and it basic it was my brother and it basically just said like, hey, I, I made the call, like I'm going to get help. And it was such a beautiful moment and it was really overwhelming for me and i i literally just started singing out which these moments are so rare you know when you write like sometimes songs just come yeah and then sometimes we really have to fight for them you know and this one was not a fight for song it was like it was just came out of my heart and i literally just started singing i can feel redemption on the wind forgiveness like the tide is rolling in taking up this space where shame is lived receiving all that you died to give, let the wind blow. Wow. And my kids were in the room, uh, 18 and 14. Jonathan was in the room. And I was like, my brother, like, he's going to get help. And we all just felt this, like, whirlwind of joy. And the next morning I got up, I was pumped to to write. I hadn't, I just hadn't been writing all year. And so I was like, oh, my gosh, I have to work on this song. And when I, the next morning when I picked up my uke, Again, like the first thing I sang out when I started playing the picking pattern was revivals in the air, catch it if you can. And I, and I stopped immediately and was like, why did I just say that? Yeah. Like, I don't even talk like that. Yeah. It's not my language. I don't like it. I mean, it was so cheeky, like catch it if you can. You know, I'm like, what is this? And I, I literally laughed out loud. I was like, that was really funny. But I felt the joy of the Lord. So I sang it again. And then I was like, God, what is this? Like, what am I saying? And 
the Lord just spoke to me and said, don't you realize you're in the middle of the truest form of revival, which is when prodigals come home. Wow. And I was just like, oh, my gosh. And, and in that moment, I would say, because I grew up in the church, I think the word revival means a lot of different things for everyone, depending on what part of the body of Christ you grew up in, depending on your experience. You know, yeah. like the word revival carries a very different meaning. And for me, growing up in the church, some of my most beautiful memories in the presence of the Lord were in revival meetings. And but I know like in my 40s, I'm like, what am I, Lord, what am I searching for in this word revival? I don't want it to be reduced to just a meeting and a starting and a stopping. Like, what does it look like when Emmanuel, God with us, invades our life, invades the 99 percent? You know, when marriages start getting restored and families reconciled and our neighborhoods are filled with compassion and love and, you know, our cities are infiltrated with lovers of God who want to lay down their life for the broken. And I think really the Lord was just, he's been reframing the word revival for me, um, which has been really special. Like I said, cause I just grew up with that word being very common and very familiar. Yeah. I mean, and I don't think it's, it's not meetings. I think it's all of it, but I think the Lord just keeps saying to me, Melissa, I don't start and stop. Like I never stop moving. I never stop reviving hearts. I never stop bringing dead things back to life. And I want, he just keeps asking me to open my eyes and see that he's all around. And, but I think the the joyful part of this song is really just this, like, I want revival to be full of joy. Yeah. And, um, the, our, some of our musicians got to go out and play on it. The fiddle is Luke Skaggs and the piano is Molly Skaggs, their brother and sister. And I just, from the first time I wrote it, I could hear Luke's violin. And I'm like, this is the truest sound of even what we carry in North Carolina is that, you know, Blue Ridge Mountain, Irish, like yeah. just that, like, let's, like, I, I could hear it so um, distinctly, which I've actually never had the experience when I've written a song hearing a specific instrument with it. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that part just actually became really fun. And the piano part, actually, funny enough, my son wrote Cadence. He's 18. Um, he had been really asking the Lord early in the fall and asking me, too, like, how do I pray for my family? What does it look like to intercede and pray? And I just encourage them to just play music and pray. Like, you don't have to have words all the time. Why don't you just play? So he had been, like, praying for his uncle for a long time and when I started playing the ukulele that night he literally just sat down at the piano and started playing that piano line wow like out of nowhere like he did we didn't talk he just sat down and I was like whoa this is overflow like he's been sowing in the spirit this this heart of prayer for his family and the Lord is just giving like melodies like it just felt like that like the Lord was handing out presents you know yeah that's yeah. amazing well, and to be able to do it together as a family. I mean, oh, it's so special, right? Yeah. You ha have another song on there that's better than, uh, was very taken with that song and just hit me. I mean, I was almost in tears as a grown man. Just how timely that song and that declaration is. I uh, wondered if you could tell, talk to us about how that came out. Yeah, well, I, I was coming to the end of 2019 as well, and I joined Melissa on a year of Sabbath last year, so neither of us wrote a lot last year. So we're coming to the end of 2019. Um, we knew there was this commission from Bethel Music to be a part of the album. They really wanted us to be a part of it. So I just started asking the Father, what are you saying over 2020? Um, what's on your heart for this next season? And he reminded me of that chorus, it's going to be better than, better than, better than I could dream. And that was born in our school that we run here in North Carolina. It was uh, during a, one of our last worship nights with our students. And we had this crescendo in the Lord's presence where uh, we spontaneously sang that <laughs> phrase, but it became this declaration over their lives, over their futures, over their stories, mm -hmm. over the journey they were about to yeah. take after they left our school. And they, they stood up in this place of confidence, really prophesying over their own story, God's going to be better than we could dream. And um, the Lord brought back that 
that course, it, we probably sang it three years ago. Yeah. He brought that back to my remembrance, and he, and I just felt this invitation from him, like, what if we sing this over 2020? And so I crafted the song around that spontaneous chorus that was born. Um, and and I love, like, in Psalm 27, you see David do this. He steps at the end of Psalm 27, he comes to this place of, like, radical confidence, and he declares... I'm confident of this. I'll see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And uh, the channel or the pre-chorus of the song says, I'll prophesy into tomorrow. Um, we will see the goodness of the Lord. And so for me, it was kind of this new kind of door opening up of like, oh, there's a place in worship where we don't just sing about God's goodness, but we literally step up as sons and daughters and prophesy goodness into our tomorrow. Yeah, really um, a faith moment of just saying, God, I do believe. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So we sit, we record it in February, literally a month after we record it, the world flips upside down and, <laughs> and to what we're in right now, you know, this crazy crisis, this crazy storm. And honestly, I, I, I've had a couple moments of like, oh my gosh, like people are going to misunderstand this song in the sense of thinking we're singing it from a shallow, kind of happy, clappy, um, naive place, you know, of like, yeah. it's going to be better than, better than. <laughs> uh, but the reality is, even for me and Melissa, there's been a lot of tension in our life. There's been a lot of disappointment, a lot of pain, even with her chronic illness. So for me to sing something like that, it's actually this this resolve of of believing yeah in this place of like violent hope like when i'm singing that chorus it's like a sword that i'm raising on the battlefield yeah. of declaring the yeah. goodness and i think that's what the end of psalm 27 was yeah, for david for sure. you know i don't think he was just in this half i think he was singing it in a place of a lot of pressure and tension um so that I'm act now after realizing that I'm like, oh, this is an incredible song for this season. Even though some of our lives don't feel better than right now, uh, maybe we lost jobs or we're stuck at home. There's things that we thought we were going to be doing this year that we're not. Um, I do believe it's this new place of us stepping up as sons and daughters and believing the goodness of the Lord. Yeah, I certainly bless me. And uh, man, how, what you're describing is is what I was taking it as and, and needed it. And we've just been singing it around the house the last few days, just such a, a come on. Anthem. That's, a, that's super encouraging. It's super encouraging. Cause I think <laughs> as, as uh, you know, as any kind of artist or yeah. just humans in general, you just, you're afraid people will misunderstand it, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, man, I really hope that hearts hear the deeper hope in yeah. it, yeah. Sure. you know? Well, in the meantime, something simple like that, and you're just like, okay, I'm saying this the same words over and over again, but like, you know, is this enough? And and I was even talking with Paul and Hannah McClure when they their album came out and, you know, Rain Above It All, they they weren't even going to put that on the album because they yeah. thought it was so too simple. And then here it is, like, we're singing at our church, you know, it's become yeah. this amazing uh, declaration as well. And, and yes. yet we need to say it. We need to say that over our life. It is going to be better because it's so easy yes. to get down in the dumps. It's so easy to think that Corona or whatever runs the world. And it's like, no. Like, <laughs> You know. Yeah, exactly. That's so good. Well, I was going to ask you, what is your guys' favorite songs? Uh, you know, obviously yours have such a connection, but as you're listening to these, you know, uh, is there any that stick out to you? As Well, you just mentioned Rain Above It All, <laughs> yeah, Paul and Hannah's. Uh, oh, man, that one is so special. I, I'll, I'll never forget the first time I heard Paul and Hannah play it live. And uh, it was just, it's one of those songs where just right from the first note, I felt the presence of the Lord wrecking my heart. Wow. Um, and we had it playing in the house the other day. It was our daughter's first time hearing it. Yeah. And uh, she's like, what, what is, what is this? Like, what is it about certain songs that all of a sudden I just, God like walks into the room. Like yeah. she, and I was like, what is vertical? It's when there's songs, it's just straight to heaven. It's straight yeah. to the, to the heart of God. So that's a favorite for me. I think even melodically, it is, you know, those songs where you can actually tap into like the most triumphant melody yeah. and sound. And I think sometimes we don't go there because it can feel contrived. And I think Rain Above It All, like melodically, is so triumphant. Like I just want to worship the Lord. And, and Paul and Hannah's hearts are so pure. 
I just, yeah, yeah. that one is, has just touched my heart so deeply. Yeah, they're the real deal. It's awesome. Yeah, they are. All right, before we go, I have, have to ask, uh, are you guys aware about something called the Helser effect, which is... <laughs> <laughs> no, I've not heard of this. Please Anytime stop. anybody sings one of your guys' songs, all of a sudden, <laughs> normal singing people become very raspy in their tone. Very what? Raspy. Raspy. I cannot Boy. tell you how many times I've heard people sing No Longer Slaves, and all of a sudden, this gravel comes out of it. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, man. That... It's amazing. The Helser effect. The Helser effects. Yeah. Maybe we could we could get like our own pedal, you know. You just, you push. <laughs> a plug in and in Pro Tools. Yeah, yes, that would be incredible. That'd be awesome. We call it what it would be called. What the Helser pedal? You, know? <laughs> you do have Jonathan quite a uh, you know a unique voice. Is there something that you have done to train it that way? Were your parents feeding you something special as a child or? Well, I uh, I was raised by oh yeah tell uh, me a, a, why a, you have that a, voice. Uh, my dad is a musician. He grew up in the '60s uh, playing rock and roll, and then he met Jesus in the late '60s. But I grew up with him as our camp pastor and traveling all over singing. So he's way more raspy than way I am. More. Oh wow! Uh, and and I have some really funny. Uh, cassette tapes of some of the first times <laughs> I led worship. Uh, it, in fact, you you might know who John Mark McMillan is. Yeah, uh, we went to school together, a uh, ministry school. Yeah. So I have some cassette tapes I could blackmail him with of us <laughs> leading worship, leading worship together. But I was like, and oh. he has some he could blackmail you. Yeah, with that's right. Or... So there's a trust there. But I was a hundred times more raspier than I am now. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're so funny to listen to, but I, I think it's my dad's influence and, um, and just the like passion that's just burning in my heart to really touch the Lord's heart. And I think it's the, like when you actually grow in leading worship before in ears and before really amazing dialed in sound systems you have to like sing really loud when i think about yeah. our our like the first oh yeah we were screaming yeah. over the drum set <laughs> like, like screaming <laughs> our hearts out you know and like now you have all these you know sophisticated yeah. things where you don't have to over sing but i'm like oh there was a beauty in a time like that a lot of young younger worship leaders don't know of because yeah. it's not the reality right now but, but where we, we had to just scream our guts out to get over we probably damaged our voices but you know <laughs> yeah. we, got some, no, we got some more stories you lose your voice by the second song your, your yeah, faith yeah, goes yeah. through the roof just to get through the last chorus you're like here exactly. comes a high note yeah i'm that's... like does this generation really know about the floor monitor and yeah. feedback and what it feels like to <laughs> sing over all of it <laughs> i'm like that is proof that we're getting old babe like yeah. we are definitely getting old yeah when people don't even know what you're talking about I, we've, <laughs> exactly. we've run into that as well so that's pretty crazy <laughs> maybe last question is just what do you want you know worship leaders that are, are looking for music you know what are you hoping that they're going to take away from the song, the albums as a whole, and any advice that you would give them in this season? Yeah, I think for me, um, I remember being, uh, gosh, 19, 20, 21 years old. Uh, I remember Kevin Prosh was one of our worship leading heroes at that time, and uh, Morningstar was a big influence on us and some of the Vineyard albums. And I, I remember, you know, when you had to go to the Christian bookstore when those albums came out and I actually get the physical product. Yeah. Um, but I remember getting in my car, putting them on. Um, and I remember hearing, I couldn't wait to hear the way they were seeing God for that next season. Like the part of God's face that they were seeing and they were going to sing about. Um, but I, more than that, I remember after hearing their albums, it would unlock uh, something inside of me to write my own songs. Um, I heard someone say one time, as songwriters, um, we, we're we always uh, imitating before we in innovate. So there is this place where we imitate others until we come to this place of innovation where we begin to sing our own song. So all that to say, my dream for other worship leaders, when they hear these songs, it would inspire them to start writing their own songs for their own cities, their own communities, their own churches. Um, 
and even like just to not despise the day of small beginnings with their songs. Even when Mel was writing revivals in the air, like we had no idea it would be on the album. It was, I didn't even think it was going to be this joy bomb song. I thought it was like this. I, Cause you wrote, you wrote it pretty laid back. Actually. It's just her and a ukulele. It was probably like half the tempo that it was in. And um, I was like, Oh, this is going to be like a little folky song. And then we showed it to the band and it like, it just, it blew up. Um, but all, all that to say, like, even what you're saying with Paul and Hannah's song, like they almost didn't put rain it up above it all on the album. Um, and sometimes I think the Lord hides from us the greatness of the songs we're writing because we would, we would get more focused on the songs than him. Um, yeah, and wow. in the, in the simplicity of those songs, actually his glory is coming in an extraordinary way. So that would be my prayer that. Our, our songs would inspire new songs in churches and communities around the world. Yeah, and I think my prayer would be, I just, my hope is even that some of the deeper stories of how the songs are written begin to really circulate with the songs, because I think we can just imagine that, you know, songwriters just sit in a, sit in a room and just, they just write these lyrics. And I think for me, that's definitely not been my the way that I write, like it's, I wait for the Lord to come and like, what is God actually saying in my heart? And I think my, my, my prayer would be that, you know, when we're just really working on something, but that we would actually also learn to receive songs from the Lord. And I think when, when you grow in maturity, you learn to receive a lot more from the heart of God. And that would really be my prayer because I think it's important that we do both. I think it's important that we, that we really steward songwriting. And it's also important that we learn to open our hands and say, God, what are you saying for my church? What are you saying for my family? What are you saying for my state or my city or, you know, my community and that we would receive as much as we would, you know, get in there and work it out. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for being with us. Thanks so much, man. And to all of our listeners, if you guys have not already heard it, go check it out. Bethel Music Revivals in the Air.